Okay, now we're going to start into the second half of chapter 12, and we just concluded the first recording, which had the lymphatic system and the non-specific defense systems. So now we're jumping into the third line of defense, which is the specific defense. Now remember, there's two major things. First, with the specific defense, it has to be primed, so it has to see the bad whatever, bad virus, bad bacteria, whatever, first, it has to be programmed, and then it will kill only what it's been programmed to kill. So that's some of the quick differences between that, where nonspecific would kill anything, and it was immediate, didn't have to be programmed. So immunology, of course, is the study of immunity, and immunity is what we want. Now, it's a functional system because there really aren't organs here. It is antigen specific. So we're going to be dealing with T cells and B cells. And again, they are programmed to only kill specific antigens, and more specifically, non-self antigens. Now it is systemic, which means that it's not restricted to the initial infection site. These T and B cells will wander through your entire body from your tippy toes to, you know, your head, everywhere. And then, of course, the biggest thing it does is memory. This mounts a much stronger attack on a previously encountered pathogen. But we're going to talk more about it here in a few minutes. All right, so we break specific immunity down into two types, humoral, which, remember, humor means bodily fluid. So these are B cells, and B cells will provide antibodies for us because B cells are found in your humors and all your bodily fluids. The second type is cell-mediated immunity. This is your T cells, and they're going to provide a defense a little differently. Now, antigens. Okay, remember, we have self and non-self. A self antigen is a protein found on our own cells. So your body has seen it before, it's good to go. A non-self antigen is a substance uh, that activates the immune system. So it could be anything from a virus, a bacteria, a cell uh, from another person. Okay, For example, say um, I need a heart transplant and one of you are going to donate your heart to me because you were in a bad accident. Sorry. Um, here's the deal. You have self antigens on all your heart cells and they are self antigens to you. But once you donate that heart to me and those self antigens for you enter my body, my body doesn't recognize them because now they're considered non-self. So the point there is just because they're self cells to you does not mean that they will not be antigenic or reactive with other people. Now haptins. Haptins are small molecules that when bound to our cells are seen as antigens. So these would cause allergies, poison ivy, uh, hair dyes, detergents, animal dander, cosmetics, penicillin. These are the types. All right, lymphocytes, they originate in the red bone marrow. Immunocompetent, that's what we want. That is where a cell is capable of responding to a single specific antigen. Now, the type depends on where in the body the cell becomes immunocompetent. So, you want a T or B cell that basically can be programmed, has the capacity to be programmed. So, the two types of lymphocytes are T cells, which will mature in the thymus, and B cells in the bone marrow. So, immunocompetent T and B cells migrate to the lymph organs and the spleen where you're filtering bad stuff. They fully mature when they bind to the non-self antigen, and thus they're programmed. All right, APCs, antigen-presenting cells. These don't respond to specific antigens like lymphocytes. They engulf these non-self antigens, and they present fragments of those antigens to be recognized by T cells. So basically what happens is they don't kill it. They just engulf it, and then they present a fragment of it at the surface so that a T cell can basically be hauling butt 
by and go, oh, oh, I can see that one's bad. All right, I'll stop. I'll take care of you. So it's an, it enables the T cells to work much more efficiently. Now, there are types of APCs. You have dendritic cells, which are found in connective tissues and epidermis. Macrophages are found in connective tissues and lymph organs. And then B cells are found in all the humors. And all of these can act as APCs. All right. <clears throat> the macrophages and dendritic cells, these uh, present antigens and activate T cells. Now the macrophages mostly remain fixed in the lymphoid organs, meaning that they stay there. Dendritic cells will internalize the pathogen and then enter the lymphatic system to present the antigens to the T cells in those lymph organs. Now, Toward the end of this chapter, we'll be talking about AIDS. And one of the ways that we contract AIDS is the vaginal lining, the penis. They're all lined with these dendritic cells. So what they do is they grab hold of the AIDS virus, they internalize it, and then they enter your own lymphatic system and bring it to the lymph node for the T cell to kill it. Problem is the T cell can't. So your body actually brought it in. The dendritic cells brought in the bad virus, thinking that our T cells could do, you know, get rid of it, but they can't. But we'll talk more about it later. Now, activated T cells release chemicals that will prod macrophages to become insatiable phagocytes and discrete bactericidal chemicals. They also release cytokines, which are types of interleukins. They stimulate the mitosis to make more T4 cells, which act like soldier cells. All right, humoral immune response. If it's humoral, then it's B cells that we're talking about. So these next several slides, we're only dealing with B cells. So here you have the clonal selection of B cells. This begins when an antigen binds to a lymphocyte, activating that lymphocyte. The lymphocyte grows and multiplies rapidly to form an army of identical clones. Plasma cells, these are B cell descendants, so these are the clones that the B cells are making. They produce much more antibodies than B cells for four to five days. Antibody levels will peak in the bloodstream at about day 10. Now, what does that mean? Well, okay, so here's the deal. B cells, basically, once they get programmed, they themselves will start making antibodies, okay, but they do it slow. So they also are going to make plasma cells. And plasma cells make antibodies much more efficiently and much faster. Now at the same time, B cells also will make memory cells. Now these are long lived, they're fewer in number than the plasma cells, and they're responsible for the immunological memory for the next time that same antigen is encountered. So let's talk about immunological memory. You have a primary immune response. This occurs on the first exposure to a specific antigen. You have a lag period of about three to six days. Then you have peak levels of plasma antibodies are reached in about 10 days. Then those antibodies levels start to decline. The second time you come in uh, contact with that same antigen, now those sensitized memory cells respond within hours. Antibody levels peak in two to three days and at much higher levels than the initial exposure and the antibodies bind with greater affinity and remain high for weeks or months. So basically a secondary immune response is, I mean, this, this is what you want. This is when people talk about, oh, I'm immune against that. That's this. What that means is that you have become in contact with this antigen and you finally figured out how to kill it. So now the next time this antigen tries to kill you, you already know what to do. So instead of having to come up with a plan, and all, no, you've got it done. So now you can react with ours, much stronger affinity and remain at higher levels longer. All right, we can easily see this in our chart here. If you look to the left, you'll see antibodies to A. Okay, so that's, you know, whatever that bad antigen A was. Again, you know, it took about 10 days for you to get your peak antibody levels, and then they immediately dropped off. Now, if you look 
follow that blue line over and then you'll see at 28 you get re-exposed to that same bad antigen A. Now your antibodies have figured out what to do. So look how high your peak is now. It's way up here. So you're making way more antibodies. You're doing it much faster and they're staying around longer. So you can come in contact with that same bad antigen a hundred more times and your body can quickly get rid of it now. Active humoral immunity is when B cells encounter antigens and produce antibodies on their own. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, you can naturally acquire them during infections or artificially acquire them through vaccines. Now, all that means is you either go out and get sick or you get a vaccine. What's a vaccine? A vaccine contains a dead or attenuated, which means a weakened pathogen, and it primes the system. All right, so you've got live vaccines, and then you've got dead vaccines. Now, the live vaccines, again, it's not, you're not getting the whole virus. What you're getting is part of the virus. So that's why you don't get full-blown sickness. Now, you're spared most of the symptoms of the disease. Now, most, okay, so if you go get a flu shot, are you going to get the flu? Yeah, you're going to get a mild case of it because your system has to be primed. You had to see that bad flu strand. You had to go through the whole programming and all that, make the antibody, blah, 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 so that, God forbid, if you're at work and some, you know, the office mate next to you gets the full blown flu and you're in contact with it again and you're in contact with the full blown virus, your body already knows how to kill it, so you won't even get sick that time. Or even if you do, you won't get the major part of the sickness where you've got the 106 fevers and you're hospitalized and you, know, you just may feel achy for a day or two. That's the point. People are so confused about vaccines. First of all, they think they're getting the whole virus, which you never do. And then they also think that they're not supposed to get sick. No, you are. You have to get a little sick to prime the system. What we're saving you is from the life-threatening versions of these viruses where, you know, you've got grandma who's 80, barely has an immune system. She'll die if she gets the full actual blown out virus but we can give her the weakened one to their immune system same thing works with little children who their immune systems aren't quite done maturing yet now we use this against several microorganisms pneumonia smallpox polio tetanus diphtheria measles these are very important and now and there's a lot of controversy about vaccines now because of the whole mercury and whatnot and you know how many vaccines you should get and how they link to autism and okay first of all the they're not linked to autism a at all okay the research that was put out in Great Britain there was a scientist who was paid lots and lots of money to falsify his report and say that autism was linked to these vaccines. Now, once he published that, several countries then went in to, write, to try to reproduce his data, and nobody could. Nobody got the same results as him. So they went back to him and said, uh, you're lying because none of us are getting the same results. And he admitted that, yes, he got paid and he lied and no, he never saw any link between autisms and vaccines. But unfortunately, once the idea was out there, it's hard to get back in. So is there a concern? Well, yeah, I mean, you've got mercury, but you also have mercury in all the seafood you eat and at much higher levels. So you kind of have to weigh the pros and cons. All right, passive humoral immunity. This differs in the antibody source and degree of protection. Here the antibodies are obtained from an immune human or an animal donor. So the B cells are not challenged. You, in other words, you never got the virus. You were given antibodies, but you never got exposed to the virus or bacteria or whatever. So there's no memory. There's no protection. Once the antibodies leave, you're done. You don't have any memory because you never saw the actual bad antigen. Now, this is how fetuses get passive immunity from the mother, and that lasts for several months after birth. But again, once those antibodies die, they're no longer immune. They have to come in contact with stuff. 
There's artificial immune serum or gamma globulin that are also given after hepatitis exposures. The immune serum <clears throat> after snake bites, botulism, rabies. Again, the effects are short-lived, two to three weeks. Once the antibodies go away, so does the immunity. All right, this is a good overview or summary looking back at humoral immunity, which is the making of antibodies. You have the active and passive, and then the naturally and artificially acquired. All right, antibodies. These are immunoglobins, also called IGs. They are soluble proteins created by the B cells in response to a non-self antigen. Now the structure, you have variable and constant regions. The variable end is what binds the antigen. Now there are five major classes, IgM, IgA, IgD, IgG, and IgEs. They all differ in structure and function. All right, for mechanisms of action, you have complement fixation. This is by far the most common, where an antibody marks a cell and a complement protein comes in and pops a hole in it and you have cell lysis. You also have neutralization where antibodies block specific sites on viruses and bacteria. If the site is blocked, then the cell can't bind to the tissues. Agglutination, that's clumping of the foreign cells by cross-linking. And then precipitation, that's where the soluble molecules get cross-linked and settle out, making it easier for phagocytosis. All right, here you can see all the mechanisms of actions for antibodies. How, how are they working? So you've got the neutralization over to the left, where basically they block the binding site so they can't bind to the tissues. Agglutination is the clumping of them, so that makes it easier for phagocytosis. Same thing with precipitation. And then complement, remember, is where the complement protein binds, pokes a hole in the cell, and everything leaks out. Okay, now we're going to move on to cellular immune response or cell mediated, which means that now we're talking about T cells. Immunocomponent T cells are stimulated to produce clones once the antigen is recognized. Now, this is unlike B cells because B cells can bind to any free antigen. Okay, so what the heck does that mean? All right, well, that means you've got B cells that are constantly floating around in all of your body humors. And a bad antigen is going to come up to one, and now that B cell is programmed for that bad antigen and will only make antibodies against it. T cells are a little different. T cells first require an APC, an antigen-presenting cell. Remember, that's where the macrophage ingests the antigen and then presents it to the T cell. T cells are also genetically coded to only recognize certain things. So where a B cell can recognize anything, that's why it's a first come, first serve. Bad antigen can walk up to any B cell and now it's programmed. T cells are not the same way. You know, you'll have strep A that will be sitting up there with an APC, but it's got to find the T cell that's capable of recognizing strep A. So there's some differences there. All right, so let's talk about the types of T cells. You have cytotoxic T cells, also called killer T cells, more commonly called T8 cells. These can attack grafts, cancer cells, viruses. They insert toxins, called perforin, into foreign cell membranes. Helper T cells, also called T4 cells, recruit other T cells to fight. And they can also interact with B cells by activating them. They release lymphokines, which will stimulate those T8 cells and B cell growth, attract other white blood cells, and enhance macrophage phagocytosis. All right, so the kind of the way you really need to think about this is we're into specific defenses now. So whatever the bad thing is, it had to be pretty bad because all of your non-specifics weren't able to get rid of it. So obviously it's a pretty big deal if we're calling in the T and B cells. I mean, they got to be programmed. There's so much ordeal with it. It's probably a pretty big deal. So when the T cells gets recognized, you have the APC with the bad antigen, it finds the T cell that can recognize it, it binds, and now it's been programmed. Not only is that T cell now 
going to start making copies of itself, but it's also going to go activate B cells so that B cells are now programmed for that specific non-antigen. And it can start making antibodies. It'll start stimulating T8 cells, calling otherwise. I mean, it's sending out an all call, emergency, emergency. Suppressor T cells release chemicals that suppress T and B cell activity. That's vital for stopping the immune response. Once you have gone through the body and you've killed all the bad non-self antigens that you were supposed to, you, you need the immune system to stop. It doesn't need to be overactive. And then, of course, memory cells, which remain after the immune response, and those provide the quick action next time you encounter that same non-self antigen. All right, so in this picture, you can see the B cells, the T4 cells, the T8 cells. And again, it's just saying that, you know, once they get programmed, they kick on everything. All right, which cell type is important for a quicker secondary response? A, plasma cells. B, helper T cells. C, suppressor T cells. Or D, memory cells. And the answer would be D, memory cells. Okay, now let's talk about transplants and rejection. All right, there are types of grafts. You have autografts, where the tissue transplants from one site to another site in the same person. This is ideal. You don't have to worry about, you know, tissue typing and matching, and it's yours. You just took it from, like, your foot to your stomach or vice versa. Isografts are genetically identical tissue donated. These are twins, so this is also ideal. Allograph is what is most common. That is where tissue is taken from an unrelated person or related but not genetically identical. So this is what we end up doing most of the time. And then there are procedures that have to be done for that, which we'll talk about on the next slide. A xenograft is where a tissue is taken from a different animal species altogether, like with cow and pig heart valves. You know, on a smaller level, that's good. Whole organs have never been successful, though. All right, when you're doing a transplant, you have to match the blood groups. So that's an easy part. Then the cell membrane antigens must have at least a 75% match. Okay, what does that mean? That means all of those antigens on the cells, you know, the things that tell us something about the cell. We've been talking about self and non-self antigens. Okay, but there are, you know, some red blood cells will have 90 antigens. That tells us 90 things about that cell. Liver cells have up in the hundreds. So, you know, all of those, 75% of them have to be identical to the person receiving that transplant. That's a lot. Now, that's the minimum we want. We're much happier if it's higher into the 80s or 90s. And depending on how bad of condition the transplant patient is in, just because there's a 75 cent match does not mean that they'll go ahead and get that transplant. If they're already in a pretty worn down state, they'll require a much higher match. Now, why is that important? All right, because what that means with a 75% match, that means that 25% your body does not recognize and will try to kill every moment of every day until you're dead or that organ is no longer inside of you. I mean, so think about that. So obviously, you'd like a higher match. Now, what do we do about that 25%? Well, we have to give you immunosuppressive therapy, which are like your corticosteroids, your cytotoxic drugs, um, radiation therapy, immunosuppressor drugs. Basically, what we're doing is we're telling your immune system not to work, to not try to kill that 25%. But there's no way to just tell the immune system, listen, I want you to still work on everything else, but when it comes to this heart organ, can you just not work on it? don't work that way. So what happens is these people are extremely prone to infections. These uh, anti or 
Immunosuppressor drugs are typically very expensive. If they lose insurance or whatever and they're no longer able to afford those medications, as soon as they come off, they're going to end up dying because their body's going to kill that organ they just got. So it's a huge, huge long-term problem. All right, let's talk about some disorders. You have allergies, which are hypersensitivities. You have abnormal, vigorous immune response, which perceives a threat that would normally be harmless to the body. It typically causes tissue damage, and the allergen here is a type of non-self antigen, or what your body thinks. Now, there are three types. Immediate hypersensitivities, also called acute, and then subacute hypersensitivities and delayed. Now, immediate and subacute are going to be dealing with B cells and antibodies. Delayed is going to be dealing with T cells. All right, let's start with acute or type 1, which is the immediate hypersensitivity. Here, the reaction can be local or systemic. It begins in seconds and it lasts about a half hour. There's no symptoms on the first encounter. B cells produce vast amounts of the antibody IgE. IgE binds to mast cells and basophils. Then the second time you come in contact with that allergen, that causes those mast cells and basophils to release histamine, which causes your runny nose, your redness, itchy, watery eyes, all the good stuff. An inhaled or ingested allergen, well, if it's inhaled, that can cause asthma, where the smooth muscle constriction. Or if you ingest it, it could cause abdominal discomfort. We treat with over-the-counter drugs, which contain antihistamines. Now, if the allergen enters the blood, you can end up with anaphylactic shock, which is a complete systemic response. This happens with bee stings, certain spider bites, and penicillin reactions. We use EpiPens, or epinephrine is used to reverse the histamine effects here. The second type is subacute. This is caused by IgG and IgM antibodies, much lower than before. It begins in 1 to 3 hours, and it lasts 10 to 15 hours. All right, you've got cytotoxic reactions where the antibodies bind antigens and stimulate complement fixation, where they pop the hole in it and everything leaks out. That's what's happening with your mismatched blood transfusions as well. The immune complex hypersensitivity. This is where the antibody antigen complex can't be cleared from the body. So what happens is it starts to accumulate and fills up that space. This is what's happening with farmer's lung, glomerulonephritis, systemic lupus, and RA, or rheumatoid arthritis. The third type is your delayed hypersensitivities, and this is completely different. This is much slower. It begins in one to three days. It takes longer because now you're dealing with T cells. They first have to bind to the APC, differentiate, program. They got to release cytokines to activate T8 cells. You got to go through all that. That's why it takes that one to three days. So it involves both the cytotoxic and helper T cells, so T4 and T8. The cytokines are released instead of histamines, and so corticosteroids are used to provide relief. And antihistamine is not going to help you here. So this happens with allergic contact dermatitis, which diffuses through the skin, like with poison ivy, heavy metals, cosmetic chemicals, um, tuberculosis tests, all of these kind of guys. What are some other disorders of the immune system? You have immunodeficiencies, which is a production or function of immune cells is abnormal. You have severe combined immunodeficiency disease. This is also called SCID. This is the boy in the bubble. It is congenital. Both B and T cells show deficits. So you don't have enough T and B cells. So minor infections become lethal. That's the reason why they live in a bubble. Bone marrow and umbilical cord transplants can provide lymphocytes. These people ultimately end up dying somewhere in their teenage years. Now, the next is acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS where the T4 cell activity is depressed. Now, AIDS is caused by HIV human immunodeficiency virus. It's transmitted via bodily fluids like blood, semen, and vaginal secretions. HIV enters the body via blood transfusion, 
blood contaminated needles, sexual intercourse, oral sex, and, and then that HIV destroys your T4 cells or your helper T cells. That depresses your cell mediated immunity. Now, <clears throat> one of the major problems that we have with AIDS or HIV is that it has an extremely high mutation rate. Okay, HIV reverse transcriptase produces frequent transcription errors. It has an extremely high mutation rate and because of that becomes resistant to drugs just as fast. So we treat with antiviral drugs but ultimately they end up dying from some type of overwhelming infection or cancer. Now normal T4 levels are between 800 and 1000. Less than 200 you're typically on death's door at this point. Now, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, AZTs, these are protease inhibitors like saquinavir and ritonavir. These, uh, you have new fusion inhibitors that also block HIV's entry, entry into helper T cells. Okay, so what do we got going on here? Essentially, and this is our biggest problem that we've had with HIV, is that it just mutates so fast because it's sloppy when it makes copies of itself it doesn't do it right so it makes all these bad copies so these bad copies unfortunately are just new strands of HIV so you could make you know worst case scenario let's say you make a cure for HIV strand one that is awesome but as soon as it mutates you now have another strand of HIV that you don't have a cure for so and right now we're looking at hundreds and hundreds of strands of HIV up into I mean thousands sorry not hundreds but thousands of different strands because it does have a high mutation rate which is why a lot of the research now goes into drug therapy because I mean are we gonna sit here and try to find the cure for all thousands of them it, yeah that's not realistic you'll have people dying in the meantime so we come up with drug therapy and they typically are on what we call a cocktail which are several inhibitors to block it from spreading Autoimmune diseases. This is where the immune system attacks self antigens and damages your own tissue. This triggers inefficient lymphocyte programming. You get gene mutations, cross reactions between antibodies, antigen, and self antigens also become a problem. We see that with rheumatic fever, where the streptococcus cross reacts with heart antigens. Now, one of the biggest things with autoimmune is it's literally where a self cell turned bad. So it was one of your normal cells that just for whatever reason turned bad and it starts attacking your own body. So there are several autoimmune disorders. Here's just a few. You've got multiple sclerosis or MS that member attacked the myelin sheaths. Myasnia gravis that was a neuromuscular where uh, it was an acetylcholine deficiency. You have Graves disease, which was a problem with the thyroid gland. Type 1 diabetes mellitus was a pancreas issue. Lupus. Lupus affects everything. Kidneys, heart, lungs, skin, every organ in the body. Glomerulonephritis is occurring in the kidneys and then RA is in the joints. Okay, vaccines prime the immune system by stimulating the production of memory cells. This type of immunity is called A passive cell mediated immunity, B passive humoral immunity, C active humoral immunity, and D active cell mediated immunity. And the answer is C active humoral immunity. Next, the homeostatic imbalance in which there is a deficit of immune cells is called A autoimmune disease, B immediate hypersensitivity, C delayed hypersensitivity, or D immunodeficiency. Answer is D immunodeficiency.